This is the web transcription service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. On March the 9th, 2016, Military History Night was addressed by Toronto writer and researcher Blake Heathcote on the fascinating subject of John Scruffy Weir, Spitfire pilot, participant in the Great Escape, and from an early age and before he really knew he was doing it, a spy. Blake Heathcote. I, now, I am often asked, as strange as it may seem, I am often asked where I find my speakers. I can tell you that this evening would not be happening had I not had to find a new eye doctor. <laughs> I know, strange, strange way. My own doctor retired and Dr. Michael Easterbrook was good enough to take me on as a patient. Like myself, he is a history buff and loaned me the survivor book the war story of John Weir, who had been a patient of his. I can tell you that I could not put that book down. I thought I would have to pay the good doctor uh, another visit due to eye strain. Believe me, it was a fantastic book. Thank you, Dr. Easterbrook. And that being said, a warm welcome. And Blake, the floor is yours. Words. You could say that I came and heard the church bells ring just near the apartment. Then it's very sad. And I was born in Pleasant Harbor, Halifax. Country. When I didn't list, uh, he was devastated. He just I, I flew over a little too close. Very tragic, but I think once. In retrospect, I think they they more daring things you did. Right. They, and as we were both Jewish, we had a special motivation. The battalion was to come in a half an hour later. Where the hole that we saw them overhead uh, when the bombing raid. The place that in Zubligat was a uh, like a motel. And you couldn't move in the daytime because they well, have. Maybe they won't come upstairs. But this so did. Robert Dunham Grant. I was born in Hamilton in 1950. We were just busy trying to clean the town. So they had. There were 12 girls came over. Uh, and, uh, in terms of Lukenwald is concerned. My brother, four brothers, and myself. Five, there was five boys in the family. And all the guys are laughing like hell, you know, because I... The I'm, war came to me. I was wounded there, and I was out for about five days. You know. I know the good Lord's on my side up there. had to be, because I... Time to pray, and I've got a story about that. When I was... And I felt... I felt futile, totally futile. Here am I, one person. What can I do? What can you do in that kind of a tragedy? The 19th century author Thackeray wrote, 
It's all very well to dream of glorious war in a snug armchair at home, but it is a very different thing to see it firsthand. For most of us, what we know about war comes from a movie, a book, or something on TV. It has some impact, but it's been tidied up and edited. And that's why I started talking to veterans. For whatever reason, I wanted to find out what being a part of that history had been like. From the start, the stories were more human than I'd expected. It was always the small details of each person's service years that was most striking. The everyday occurrences and twists of fate. Small moments of life. My grandfather, he used to talk to me about enlisting during the first war. Joining up then was just a big adventure, which is, I think, what so many who joined up in both wars were expecting. Look at their faces in these pictures. These are boys and girls. But the adventures they found were greater than anyone had ever dared to imagine. The young men and women in these photographs grew up quickly they had to develop a completely new sense of what the future meant. Tomorrow was a lifetime away. The randomness of life was burned into their hearts. Sometimes you can see it in their eyes. And it's a humbling experience to hear their stories. Veterans understand the gift that life is. They know what their lives cost. They know we're living on borrowed time, if only because the men and women of their generation put their community first and left their own lives as an afterthought. This is the debt we owe our veterans. And this is what the Testaments of Honor Project is about. To take time from our lives to listen and to honor our vets is a small price to pay towards that debt. We cannot let their legacy pass unheard or unheeded. I, I would certainly like them to know that, that their, their fathers and their grandfathers went to a war which wasn't just a lark. The war had to be fought. It had to be stopped. And, and uh, it's been a different world ever since. And we owe it to those men and women who died in that war to make it possible for what we have today. For Canada to be the tremendous country it is today. Absolutely tremendous. I made that video 15 years ago when I was just starting the Testaments of Honor project. It was meant to explain what I was hoping to do. Since then I've recorded about 550 interviews with veterans across the country. I think it's an extraordinary way to connect with our history, to be able to meet the people that way. I have a friend here, Neil Orford, who's a teacher who's been recognized by the Governor General for doing just this type of extraordinary work. We both believe the importance of having the personal histories of people inform its study. And each of these stories that I've come across is remarkable in its own way. But there was one that was very special. It was about a guy named John Scruffy Weir. That's John in Winnipeg. Before he got started. 
John enlisted in the RCAF on September 4th, 1939, the day after Britain declared war and almost a week before Canada did. He was posted to 401 Squadron, which was the number one Canadian fighter squadron in Britain. That's John in the center, by the way, looking at the camera and smiling. His squadron, when he arrived, had been decimated. And by the fall of 1941, almost everybody flying in John's section was a replacement. That made John very nervous because it meant he would be flying with an inexperienced partner or, or wingman, and that's very dangerous. You see, with a new guy, know what to do in action. They could only learn by flying hours and hours together, and there simply was no longer time for that. On November 8th, 1941, the squadron was scrambled into action. They flew in twos. The flight leader, that was John, was up front, and then the, the wingman or the tailman was behind, watching. Now the sky up there, it's huge. It's vast. You can see for ten, sometimes hundreds of miles. Now, we've all heard the stories of the Devil Bay Care pilots with the silk scarves. Well, there's a reason for that, which I just love. So imagine being up there. You're the, the, the flight leader, and you're scanning the sky like this all the time. And the, the tailman or the wingman is also watching the sides and watching the leader's back. But these guys went to battle wearing a shirt and tie for the love of God. And so very early on in the first war, they discovered that if they got a silk scarf and wrapped it around their shirt, it protected their neck from the chafing. And that's how they got the wonderful, glamorous look. I just love that story. So as John and his wingman broached the French coast, Almost immediately, they were attacked from high and above by Messerschmitts, ME-109s. John was nervous. He nervously checked back over his shoulder very quickly to see if his tailman was in position. It was a big, big mistake. You see, up there, things go very, very fast. They're flying towards one another at about 375 miles an hour. So literally, in a split second, you can lose sight of the other guy or of the enemy. His tailman, Gardner, all of a sudden shouted over the radio he was being attacked from behind. And bang, a moment later, Gardner was dead. But three seconds after that, John's wing was shot off, his, his Spitfire, and then machine gun fire raked his instrument panel, which took out all his instruments. But it also pierced his gas tank, which then sprayed gas back all over him. Now John was breathing pure oxygen, and he's covered with gasoline, and the instrument panel begins to spark. So in a split second again, the cockpit's filled with fire and John's engulfed in flames. So he manages to kick open his canopy and bails out at 26,000 feet. He lands very hard, very battered and very burned. But curiously, he was prepared to deal with just such a challenge, more prepared than most. And here's why. His father was Lieutenant Colonel Gordon Weir, who trained John from when he was very young. Gordon was a, a war hero, a war hero in Vimy and through the war heavily decorated. And he did extraordinary things through the whole war, and then after the war, continued to do remarkable things. He was one of the founders of McLeod Young Weir. He was one of the founders of the Granite Club. That's him at the Granite Break and of the Babington and Racket Club. But he thought that being unremarkable was a smart place to be. Don't show off. Don't make a scene of yourself. Keep a low profile. It's something he always instilled in John. He, his ancestry was Scottish, and he believed the Scots were survivors, and he was determined that his son, too, was going to be a survivor. And so he started training him from when he was very young. Gordon loved Algonquin Park and used to bring him bring John with him on trips. Gordon had a, an Ojibwa guy named Fiji who would take Gordon around to best fishing and hunting spots. And when John was old enough, about nine years old, he invited him along too. And he decided he wanted John to learn from Fiji. And John adored Fiji. Fiji lived in the park year round. Yet he would take John into the loudings and explain 
how the foxes got rid of their, their fleas, and watching otters at play, just extraordinary stuff. And John was just mesmerized by this guy. There was a weird friendship between the two of them. Gordon saw this and he thought, okay, I've got an idea. I'm going to have Fiji show John how to survive, how to live off the land. So he invited John to invite two buddies. And the three boys, 10 years old, went off with Fiji for a week to learn to survive in Algonquin Park. But they could bring nothing with them except a jackknife and the clothes on their back. That was it. So after the first day in the park, the three boys hated it. They hated it. They were eating grubs. They were slicing worms and frying them. They, food was coming up faster than it was going down and they wanted to go home. That was not all. But by the end of the week, they developed this extraordinary sense of, of confidence and a sense of how to get by. But for John, there was more. You see, his father, every summer, would go to, to Europe on business and work with his clients in France and in the Netherlands and also in Germany. And through the 10 years between uh, 1927 and 1937, John would go with them. And he saw the rise of Nazi Germany from all the major cities. Gordon, unbeknownst to John, all this time was helping his clients secretly immigrate to Canada from Germany and from France and from the Netherlands and keeping their assets intact. But again, John didn't know about this until years after the war because Gordon never ever talked about it. He only learned about it because some of the Dutch families came to John long after the war and said very discreetly how much his father had done for them. But for John, it was just an exciting trip. But he would run little errands for his dad on the trip. He would run messages between hotel rooms. He would watch for a certain guy in a, in a hotel lobby and report back to his, his dad. To him, these were just games. They were just fun things to do. But it got more interesting when Uncle Adrian joined them. Now, Uncle Adrian wasn't really an uncle, but he was one of Gordon's best friends. Uh, Adrian had also been a war hero, heavily decorated as a pilot. His full name and title at the time was Air Commodore Sir Adrian Chaudier. And Adrian was RAF intelligence. But he would come along with John and Gordon on these trips. And when Gordon was in business meetings, Adrian and John would go and play games. One of their first games was the observation and memory game, as John described it, very much like I think scouts still play now. They would go into a room, and then they'd leave, and Adrian would say, okay, how many paintings on the wall? How many doors? How many windows? That, that lady in the third row, what was she wearing? How about the fellow next to him? And John was good at it, and he got better and better. And then, as the days went on, and Adrian introduced new games. He introduced something called the um, contact game, where they would go into, say, into Cologne, into the city square, and Adrian would say, okay, here's the game. You follow me, but don't let me see you following me. I'll give you about 10, 15 seconds start, and then you just kind of lie low and see if you can follow me. John thought this was great, and off they went. And within a minute, Adrian had disappeared. He just vanished, and it freaked John out. John was 15, and it's strange. He didn't speak much German, and he didn't know what to do, but all of a sudden, Adrian materialized beside him. And John thought this was fantastic. And so over the next few weeks that they were there, Adrian showed him how you can lose somebody if they're following you. And then slowly, he showed him how you can follow somebody without being seen. Again, John thought, this is great. This is wonderful. They, they added to that uh, a contact game whereby they had dead drops, messages left for somebody else so you could exchange information without actually having to meet somebody, leaving marks on the wall and little flags here and little symbols there. And it was just, it was a dream for a 15-year-old. What John didn't know was that Adrian had built a secret intelligence network. Uh, based on his contacts with the RAF intelligence, he believed from probably 1930 that Germany was going to war again. And he could see, he was tracking German spies embedding themselves in England. So his secret intelligence network, their one purpose was to track down and extract German spies. John would later become a part of that network, but that's, that's later in the story. What John 
really got from Adrian, most of all, apart from just the fun, was he instilled in John a love of flying, which is why four years later, John enlisted in the Air Force, a week after, oh, a day after Britain declared war. And so that's John with his girlfriend, Fran McCormick, who we later married, and John had just earned his pilot's wings. And so he had, he's posted to 401 Squadron, as I say, where he was known as Scruffy. And that's a fun story. Let me tell you that story. So it started in Canada when he was in training. He was flying a thing called a ferry battle, which is an old jalopy of a plane. It was in service, I think, for the first two weeks of the war, and they pulled it out because it was slow. It had a machine gun on the back, and it was just, it had no other defenses. I mean, it was the most vulnerable, useless fighter bomber in the Air Force, but it was useful for training. It was pretty sturdy, and so that's one of the planes John learned on. It did, however, had a quirk, which is that the engine tended to catch fire, <laughs> or it would seize up and stall, and indeed that happened to John. John was coming in, and the engine started to choke, and, and then it stalled and died just as he touched down, and it burst into flames, and it exploded, and it sprayed glycol all over him. Now, glycol is an engine coolant. It didn't do him harm, but it kind of bleached his tunic in a mottled, kind of ugly fashion which is not a big deal, except these guys only had one uniform. And John had put on some weight, and so it was kind of straining at the buttons, and, well, he looked like hell. But wouldn't you know it, when he got back to barracks, he found out that uh, there was a, a visit from a, an RAF group captain, and they were going to have to do an inspection. So all the guys mustered out on parade on the tarmac, smart as paint, and John was there just looking as, as smart as he could. And the group captain walked up and down the line looking at the boys, and he came to John. He looked at John, looked him up and down. Then he turned to the commanding officer as though he was missing some joke. The CO said nothing. He looked again at John. Then the group captain turned back to the commanding officer and said, rather scruffy looking individual, wouldn't you say? And walked on. But there was a, a ripple of laughter down the line. And from that day until the end of his life, John was known as scruffy. Anyway, let's return to John in France, 1945, uh, 41. He'd been shot down. He's bruised and badly burned and badly lying in a field. A, a, a French resistance fighter comes across him, and John asks for help, like getting away, being hidden, anything. And the resistance guy wants to help, gives him some water, but he says, you've been burned, and you know, you're, you're kind of in rough shape. I think you better stay here and be picked up by the Germans. They can give you the medical attention you need, and, and you're gonna need some attention. And if they catch me here, they're going to shoot me. And John, who felt like he had a sunburn and his eyes were hurting, thought, okay, that's the best thing to do. And that's indeed what happened. And the Germans showed up about 10 minutes later, and they took him to a place called Dulag Luft, which was the interrogation facility just outside of Frankfurt. Usually they kept you there for a week to give you a thorough going through, but John, they kept there just for a day, a day maybe, because these guys were Luftwaffe Air Force, and John looked bad. And he was the kind of injury that all airmen feared. So they thought, let, let the poor guy go. And John was sent off to a small hospital where they really didn't have much to help him with. They had Vaseline with boric acid, which they would smear on in the morning with some gauze. And at the end of the day, they'd peel it off, really to prevent infection, while the skin started to regenerate. That went on for about two months. It was not a pleasant time, but nothing in the way of anesthetic, not even an aspirin. But eventually, the infection threat passed, and John was sent off to his first POW camp, which was Stalag Luft 1. It was in the north of Germany, on the Baltic. Uh, all he wanted to do was to escape and get back into the war. But it was too isolated, and it was just impossible to get away from. What's more, it was winter. The ground was frozen, so it was too tough to, to dig. And his hands had been so badly burned, he couldn't really form a fist. Uh, oh, here's a picture, by the way, of John, about three months after he was shot down. Um, he has no eyelids, and you can see how badly he is burned. I mean, the skin's starting to heal, but uh, he really didn't have any eyelids for the next couple of years. But again, that's later in the story. Anyway, the silly bugger still wants to escape, and so he goes to the escape meetings 
<laughs> and, and see what information you can find out. And the guys are trying to dig, but it was close to the Baltic, and the ground was sandy, the tunnels kept collapsing. And so that was kind of a lost cause. But in the escape committee, they swapped information about the best places to escape to and the best ways to escape. And they also traded rumors, one of which was they were all going to be transferred to a new camp, a new high-tech escape-proof camp, soon. Because Stalingrad, one where they were, was the biggest and the first German POW camp, and it was getting jammed full because Germany was really the war, no questions. They were going from victory to victory, and they kept jamming guys, and this is even before the U.S. were in the, in the war. Anyway, John realizes that that transfer from Stalin left one to the new camp will be his only chance to escape. And so he starts thinking about that. He learns that in the trip from, uh, from Barth, where the Stalin left one camp is, down to the new camp, they'll pass through Stettin. Now, Stettin's a port. And if you can get down to the port, there's bound to be a sympathetic ship, maybe from Sweden or Denmark, and you get some nice guy captain who would hide you on board till the ice passed or melted and get you back across the Baltic. So John figures that's exactly what he's going to do. The train apparently goes into Stettin, stops at the station, they get a bit of water, and then as it leaves the station, the train goes up a bit of a rise. And the rumor in the escape committee bunch were, that's where you jump out. As the as the train goes out of the station and goes up to this rise, it almost stops. And that's the one place where you can jump off. After that, the trains head south to Berlin and then due east, and you're dead after that. And so, that's what John does. He gets on the train and sits down with a couple of guys opposite him. And he looks at the window and tries to figure out how to get out with his little claw-like hands. He starts wiggling at a wooden wedge that's holding the window shut. They aren't locked or screwed, they're just these little wooden jammed wedges in. I mean, the Germans were winning and the, the security was lax. There was one guard at the end of the, of the car, but he didn't care. So John starts wiggling one wedge out, gets a second wedge out, and gets the window free. And the guy sitting next to him, Michael, who we knew from camp, said, what the hell are you doing? And John said, I'm going to escape. And Michael said, can I come? John said, sure. Now, there's two other guys sitting opposite him, and they think, I, I will, we will we'll come too, and John said, sure, why not? And so they swap places, and John starts wiggling out the other window that was free, and these guys start looking up and down, wondering if John's out of his mind. But John is all gung-ho. Anybody who knew John knew that John was a force to be reckoned with. He gets up and goes up and down the car and begs and borrows little chocolate bars and rations and cigarettes and anything they might need to last them a couple of days once they get off the train and then find their way down to the harbor to find a ship. Good. That's done. So they come to Stettin. They leave Stettin. As, as forecast, the train slows down. John gives the signal and says, okay, what happens is I'm going to go out first. I can't carry the bag. You toss it out after me. Then you guys jump, roll down the side of the trail of the train tracks, lie flat till the train's out of sight, and then we'll get going. That's what happens. John gives the signal. Out he goes. He rolls down, lies flat, waits till the train goes past, all clear, no worries. He stands up and there's Michael, about 100 yards away, and Michael's good. And John said, where are the other two guys? I don't know, I don't know. They are there. John said, where the hell's the food? <laughs> so there they are, it's about 2 o'clock in the morning, beginning of March, in northern Germany, dead of winter, with nothing to eat. But John doesn't worry about it. He just gets moving. But it's getting cold, and they're, they're starving. They finally find, just before dawn, a gardener's hut on the outskirts of town, and they lie low there for about, well, about a day. They finally eat the little tiny bits of pieces of chocolate John has in his, in his, he stuffed in his coat pocket, and work up the energy to make it down to harbor. They have to avoid all the checkpoints, but they get down to the harbor. And they find two ships, but they're German, and there's no sign of anybody, there's no sign of life. And they have a couple of very close calls, but they get away. Now they're stuck in the harbor. But John, John remembers something you heard in the escape committee. There's a whorehouse, it's a team, and it's run by Polish girls, or it's staffed by Polish girls. These are girls whose families did not cooperate with the Germans. 
And so the Germans took all the daughters and shipped them off to whorehouses across Germany to serve as German soldiers. God bless the Germans. And John says, apparently these guys will help any evaders. They're very, very sympathetic. So let's go to try to find the whorehouse. And so they went looking. And actually, it wasn't that hard to find. They found a house at about 4 o'clock in the morning that had lights on. They watched at a distance. There's a couple of men going in, a couple of guys coming out. John says, that's got to be the place. He said, now, I know what these buildings are like. I've been in a lot of these small hotels. You go to the front door, and there's a, a hallway. You go straight to the back. And at the back, there's a staircase up to the second floor. That's where the girls are. And that's where we're going. We don't talk to anybody. We don't look at anything. We go straight to the back and upstairs. Now, there's probably going to be some kind of a, a reception room, a bar, a lobby or something as you go in. Don't stop there. Don't talk to anybody. Just keep going right to the back. And, and you're deaf and dumb. He says to Michael, you say nothing. Now, I'll go in first. And if after a couple of minutes you don't hear shouting or shooting, it's probably clear. Okay, that's the plan. So in goes John. And much as he thought, there's a hallway right down to the back. As he walks through, other, in the corner of his eye, he can see some kind of a bar or something, and a couple of guys, he thinks, standing at the bar, but he just barrels right to the back because he's after the girls. And he stops at the back, at the foot of the stairs, waiting to hear. And he hears the door, and it's Michael. And Michael comes in, so John starts going up, up, up the stairs. And then he hears, Hunt! And you! and the clicking of a pistol. And he goes back to the bar, and there's a Gestapo officer there with the bartender looking terrified, and Michael with his hands up. And the Gestapo wants to know who they are and what they're doing. And John, who has some German, says, well, look, here's the truth. We're a couple of French POWs, slave labor. We wanted to get a couple of girls, and maybe if we got lucky, we could skip back to home for a couple of days and see our families. And the Gestapo guy, he was 90s, apparently. <laughs> He said, guys, that, that isn't going to happen, but look, have a sandwich. This is all in German. I'll buy you a beer. So they sit down, and Michael plays his part, silent, can't speak. And John and the Gustavo swap notes. John gives some cock and bull story about where he grew up in France and where Michael's from. And, and the Gustavo says, well, what, what's with your friend? Oh, John says, uh, don't cough, uh, shell shock, you can't. Oh, that's fine. And they go on chatting, and there's a beat pause. And then the Gestapo officer turns to Michael and in perfect English says, and where are you from? And Michael says, Surrey. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and they all, they all started to laugh. And, and the Gestapo said, I'm sorry guys, I, I'm going to have to take you in. You're not going to have a very nice week, but that's what's going to happen. And that's what happened. And they went in, they spent a week in, in Gestapo jail. They had the stuffing beat out of them, but they survived. And a week later, they were put on a train to a new camp that's very far away, on the Eastern Front. In, it, it was, it is now Poland, that's how far, and it was very high security camp, with uh, guard towers and double fences and guards with dogs around the perimeter. The huts were raised up so you couldn't conceal Dickie, like guards could look underneath. There were microphones buried in the sound, in the ground, so you could hear the sound of digging. But it was a new camp. John, in fact, was, Kriegi number 715. Uh, Kriegi was the, 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 the prisoner's nickname for the proper term, which was Kriegskafaner, Kriegskafaner, which is literally prisoner of war. Uh, but in this camp, this high security camp, because there were so many prisoners, what the Germans hadn't realized, bringing all, they were pretty much all Brits and Canadians and some other Commonwealth companies, uh, countries, no Americans yet. But there was this huge pool of talent, guys who'd been in camps since the beginning of the war, escape artists, engineers, forgers, artists, tailors, and language specialists. It was an incredible, rich body of, of talent, of skills, just looking for a way and a reason to escape. And that's what led to John's next adventure. See, when he was a teenager, John had worked in the mines in Northern Ontario in hard rock mining, so he knew all about digging mines and how to short mines, as did his fellow um, squadron mate, and he actually knew from St. Clemens in Toronto, Wally Fluddy. They were buddies. And the two of them became the key tunnelers in what later became known as the Great Escape, the Big Mass Escape. But that, of course, is 
a later part of the story. I first interviewed John at the RCMI in 2001, but it took five more years for him to open up and to share his story with me, and what a story it was. Now, that pretty much wraps up my talk. And for those of you who never had the fortune to get to know John, to meet John, you had my condolences, because you would have loved him. He was the most delightful, funny guy. And I hope at some point you'll have a chance to read his whole story, because this is really just a part of it. But I also want you to think about this in closing. Our personal experiences and the stories of our parents and our grandparents, the things they lived through, they make us who we are. So take time to preserve those stories, to record them, write them down, whatever, because that's really what history is. And if you ever need my help, take one of my cards on your way out and drop me a line. I can help you get it done. But this is important stuff. Please don't let it disappear. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. Yes, Christy. Uh, I never heard about anything related to his activity as a spy, or his father's, or Uncle Adrian. Is there any information that can be found anywhere about that particular period of time and whatever those activities were that they were engaged in? I mean, he was my godfather. I've known him since I was a baby. I never heard anything about any of this at all. No. <laughs> we, we tried. What John said, Adrian's secret intelligence network, it's in the book, is called Inquisitor. The whole core purpose of it was to fly below the radar of MI5, MI6, and the SOE. Because Adrian, who'd been involved with them, saw all the bureaucratic nonsense that went on. Some of the ways they screwed up, I talk about it in the book. So he wanted Inquisitor to really basically be invisible. So the members never met each other. There were communication protocols, again, which I talk about. But it was, as I, John put it, he said it was designed to be unknown. And John continued to do things for them until the late 70s, tracking Nazis. And I've wondered about this because, you know, it's, it, how do you prove something invisible exists? And there's not a bloody way. But I did write a chap named David Cornwell, who's better known as John Le Carré, because he was a, an intelligent operative in the 50s and 60s. And I said, was he aware of anything like this? And he said, it was before his time. But he said, what you're describing is exactly what I saw all kinds of. So he said, I have no doubt that's exactly what's going on. And frankly, there's a lot of it going now with the whole terrorism threat. It's that kind of invisible cell, except what Acquisitor did was to locate spies and then Nazis on the run after the war, and they did it for years. And as John said shortly before he died, for all I know, they're still operative. But there's not a trace. Not a trace. Yes, sir? To, to which extent did his father know what he was up to with Uncle Adrian? Well, again, who knows? Because Adrian and Gordon were very close. They had to know each other what, what each other was doing. But they didn't talk about it. Gordon never talked about the stuff he was doing. And I think it's safe to say that Gordon would have known exactly what Adrian was doing. Adrian wasn't sneaky. And Ian Weir, John's son, who I, I know best of the family, said that as he started digging, I, I finished working with John about 2007 or 8. He died in 2009. Ian started digging around after John died because we started, we thought there's more to the story. And he discovered that his his mom, Fran, uh, was in intelligence with Camp X. His aunt, Aunt Nancy, was with the uh, SOE in the Middle East. And every, almost every family member was involved in this intelligence network. Uncle Adrian's wife, Auntie Ted, was SOE, and she's the one who recruited Nancy. And so it's like, who the hell wasn't in intelligence? So they had to know. But again, it's, it's a tough thing to track and to prove. But boy, it sure does whet your appetite to want to know more, doesn't it? <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? Yes, Bruce. I would be remiss if not mentioning that my father was a member of the 
RCMI, a long-term member of the Holocaust Museum Committee. The Blake's mother was a great help at the museum auctions. He was one of the recorders. Yeah my, yeah, my dad was a long-time member of the museum committee. He's the one who got me involved here. And that's where I started interviewing people. But uh, I think more than I understood, when I was young, in the 1960s, I, mean, I saw The Great Escape. That was terrific. I knew a lot about the war. And so when I started interviewing vets here in 2000, I guess, I thought it was going to be easy because I did know so much about the war. So I'd seen all the movies, I'd read books, but and the first guy I sat down with made me realize I didn't know anything. And it's not because I didn't know some of the history. What I didn't know was what it was like from a pers first person point of view. Which of course is actually what history is. And my dad helped me appreciate this. I grew up with my grandfather who was in both wars. And my dad hearing stories, but it was like, yeah, okay. But when I started to actually listen, I thought, oh, okay. And so my dad got involved with Bruce and all the other and Gregory and all the, all the people on the museum committee and loved working here because without making a big deal out of it, he knew how important it was to preserve this stuff. And in my funny little way, that's what I love doing too. And I, I, can't, I can't encourage you guys enough to do it. It doesn't matter if you're military or not. Save your family's stories. They're precious. Any other questions? Thank you so much for coming. You've been very kind and I really appreciate your attention. This has been another in the ongoing series of podcasts brought to you as an educational service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. You can keep abreast of our web offerings as well as our live events by visiting our website at www.rcmi.org. Once again, this is Eric Morse saying thank you for being with us and good night.